Yes. So, hello. Hello, Jason. Hello, Madhu. Hello. And, I'm hello. Uh, and I think, so today we are doing a hangout for World Space Week. And uh, I'm just going to talk a minute about World Space Week so we have more viewers who join in before I introduce Jason. So, uh, you know, World Space Week is, every, is held every year from October 4th to 10th. And that is to celebrate uh, astronomy throughout the whole world, astronomy and space sciences throughout the whole world. And it's a UN celebrated event. So, uh, you know, every year we have these Google Hangouts uh, where we bring in scientists from around the world so they can interact with our students and uh, tell them more about what's going on in the real world of space sciences. So today we have with us here uh, Dr. Jason Held, and uh, I'm going to give it another minute. So Jason, uh, you can see the viewers uh, listed. Can you also see it? Uh, I, I can see the viewers. I, ju I just uh, see uh, your your face, and maybe I could switch to, to Maru. Okay. Um, but uh, I mean, you see a listing down there of five viewers. Can you see that? Uh, no, I, I don't have any okay. listing. Okay. Uh, okay. Hang on. So that's fine. You don't have to have the listing. You don't have to have a listing. I just want to tell you that for each listing we have here today, we have a whole classroom full of full of students who are logged in. Great. That one listing. So, <laughs> so we are being broadcast into. Uh, so when it shows one viewer, it's actually a whole classroom full of viewers. So yeah, I just want to make you and uh, who <laughs> aware of that. <laughs> so, you want me on my best behavior, is what you're telling me. I'll I'll, I'll be on my best oh. behavior. <laughs> <laughs> right. Or they might enjoy uh, fun behavior too. So that's fine. Okay. I'm sure we'll have fun. So yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and start. Uh, we are going. We are, on behalf of space, I welcome here today, Dr. Jason Held, uh, and Madhu Jha, Madhu Jha, who is my co-host from space. Uh, Dr. Jason Held is CEO of Saber Astronautics, and uh, you're right now in Australia, right? Uh, I right now I'm in Australia. Okay, That's great. So we're talking, uh, you know, over the uh, latitudes with Dr. Jason Held right now. And uh, I welcome Ms. Madhu Jha, who is educator in charge of space. And she will be representing, representing all the students here today. So Dr. Held, uh, please tell us a little bit more about yourself. Uh, well, the short end of a long story is I'm a space engineer, uh, originally out of Colorado in the US, uh, so I'm American. Um, I was also in the, in the Army for about 10 years, uh, and I was a major in the U.S. Army, and uh, I went to Australia originally for a master's, ended up with a PhD and a wife, and uh, so here we are, you know, so it's kind of life kind of takes you around to, to, to these places, and I, I found it Saber Astronautics after my PhD, because I saw a lot of the, the potential for small satellites and, and uh wanted to be a part of this, the, the space industry and, and push it in, in my own way uh, that, that I thought would be interesting and, and attach my own research to it as well. So really just the story of getting your research uh, out into the commercial world is, is really a special journey. That's my story. So, yeah, that's an exciting story and I'm, I hope all our young students who are logged in and uh, you know, many of them wonder how, uh, whether they should pursue a career in astronomy. And hopefully this will push them along that path. Yeah. So well, uh, now's the time yeah. for it. You know, you, you get about the next five years is really perfect. So if you're graduating now, if you're in third or fourth year now, it's really the right time. You know, it, it's, uh, I, I remember when, when, I was, when I was leaving the army and, and don't worry, I'll be quick. Uh, but but I, I remember I was leaving the army and I went back to the States uh, and the IT boom was was just finishing. It was 1998, and and I had just missed it. So now you guys are just in the right position to get started. So it's an interesting time. So, yeah. Uh, so I think we can go ahead and uh, uh, you know maybe have you give us a presentation on 
uh, what Sabre Astronautics does and uh, you know what what is the future of space sciences so that students can also find out more about what's going on. Yeah. Okay. Handing it over to um, this is okay. So I'll go through. This is about twenty six slides. I'll go through them pretty quickly then. I uh, and I. Uh, we're going, to, we're going to be talking about space operations, uh, and I'm going to be talking about. I mean, it's a it's a it's a bit of you know, about the research our company does, but it really gives you a hint as to the direction that that space operations is going to. Um, first, a, a quick background about Sabre Astronautics. We're a small business based in Boulder, Colorado, and Sydney, Australia. Uh, we do have a few customers out at in at in India. Uh, we we worked previously on Hubble and the ISS, uh, and also for Space Command. Um, out of the U.S. and uh, you know, a lot of us have worked with small businesses before. So if you if if you think about the skill set, very strong on space operations and flight software. So um, what I'm going to give you is is the uh, cookbook version on uh, how to do space operations and and how to use space operations to plan out your 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 the value of your own space mission, which is important to do if you're planning science missions. It's also equally important to do if you're planning uh, commercial missions as well, right? So, really, we, we broke this up into a couple of, of blocks, uh, really like a cookbook. Um, five different steps, you're defining the customer, who they are, defining what product you're trying to do. If you're, if, if you're a business, you know, product is simply something you're trying to sell. Uh, or if you're an academic or a scientist, then a, a product is, is something you, that you're using to develop your science. Um, once you have that, then the next step is to define orbits and overpasses. And uh, those overpasses gives you the amount of time that uh, you have to download your products. And you sum that up, and then you could relate that sum of time using a little bit of very basic satellite communication skill uh, and just a little bit of easy math to calculate the number of potential sales or the dollar value of, of the actual science that you're trying to do. So if you're writing grant proposals as an academic, it's important uh, to, to know this, or if you're writing business plans, it's also important. Okay. So um, our first step is, of course, to find the, the customer, and, and you're asking who they are and, and what they want to do with the data and how often do they need it, right? And, and these three questions tie directly into your satellite design and your payload design. For example, if you are trying to use pictures for uh, fire detection or for agriculture or we see a lot of satellite missions these days for smart cities and, and clean tech, most of these missions are satellite imagery, but some of them are for satellite communications as well as in sending data over the internet uh, through the satellite, right? So you, you have to find out uh, what how the customer is going to use it, what that use case is, because that then directly defines the spacecraft and how you engineer it. So if, if any of you have ever done spacecraft design before, uh, you know that the design of your spacecraft, your mass budget and your power budget is always a function of that payload design. And the payload design is always a function of what that customer needs. Okay, so um, it's very important to keep in mind you have to define it. Uh, usually this definition is, is coming in the form of uh, a frequency that you need to get allocated uh, for your satellite or for the actual size and bits of the data. Okay, so just for, for an example here, um, just some, some data products that, that you can get anywhere on the, on the internet. I think this is a Planet Labs that, uh, product. A uh, small satellite product. You're talking about three to five meters per pixel is what you're going to get here for imagery. Um, for science, that is as well. It could be quite a bit more abstract. It could be uh, thermal, um, yeah, or in this case, it's precipitation. It's radar data for 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 soil moisture, uh, which is quite important if you're doing an agricultural type of a type of a study. Uh, and also, you know, I've, I've got a lot of customers that are looking at us for, for communications. They say, hey, we want to send small bits of data. All right, so um, just an example defining the customer. This is a uh, download that we did from uh, NOAA, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration out of the U.S. It's a U.S. weather satellite constellation. Uh, and you guys actually, if you have a, a satellite dish, 
all this is publicly available. You can download this yourself using your own dish. Uh, it's it's not it it's encoded, but you could get the encoder online and you could download it yourself. Um, so the data is. So I'll, just, uh, so I'll just ask you a question that uh, sure. uh, do you are you uh, helping them the customers download the data from the satellite archives, like uh, where the data is stored, or Some from the satellite itself? Oh no no, Saver's Saber's role is operations. So so we sell okay. software that lets people control okay. their own satellites, or we right. do it as a service. So we've had customers out of the U.S. Because uh, if you're launching from the U.S., uh, you need a ground station in this part of the world, uh, and Australia is a very popular place. So you know we'll, we'll take data from the satellite and we'll hand it to them. All right. Okay. Um, but but anyways, like I mean, you can see this, this you know, an example of the data that comes down. But you can see that, and I wanted to point this out. You've got errors, and you've got different types of errors. You've got these kind of long line stripes uh, where it's noise in the system. Um, <coughs> excuse me, which is usually the, the satellite uh, dish hitting the horizon. And then you've got these lines right here, these, these, these dashes uh, that are very straight dashes. That's actually space radiation hitting the image. So I want you to kind of keep that in the back of your mind that you take a picture and that, that, that product is not always perfect. You usually need to take more than one. Um, also keep in mind that the size is very important. I right? see so to find a customer. The customer wants weather data, a basic weather data picture. If you measure it out, it ends up being one to two k to two thousand uh, k bit, uh, bits per, per image. Okay, so that'll be important later. Um, yeah. Then for the for the overpass, uh, you want to calculate. You want to find out when a satellite is going to be overhead. Two different questions, uh, and you want to determine when you can use it. Right. So. Satellite being overhead, uh, your ground station is slightly different from the satellite being overhead of customer. So, uh, if the satellite is, is sitting o overhead a farm, you want to know if it's going to be able to image your crops or when you can use satellite phone. And these, this is the type of information you want to know. Um, for in particular, duration of the of the overpass. But also you want to know day-night cycles, and, and that's important to note depending on the type of sensor you have. If it's a panchromatic image and you're trying to take a picture at night, maybe you need infrared for the camera instead. So very clearly you can see how this goes back into the design of your satellite. Um, and on the ground station, uh, you, you want to know when you as the customer can see the satellite. So on one side the satellite is looking at you, and the other side uh, you're looking at the satellite itself. All right, now, to, to answer these questions, you're going to need, uh, obviously, information about the satellite and the type of sensors, and the, the TLE, which stands for two-line element set, and information on the ground station, where really what, most of what you need is latitude and longitude uh, for the ground station, okay? So uh, for those of you, most of you should know what a two-line element set is, all right? But for those of you who haven't, a really, really good reference, if you look at uh, Celestrack.com is a website which uh, has access to all of the NORAD uh, SGP4 orbits. So these are all your standard orbits with perturbations. Uh, it gives you a good position of the satellite. You, from a two-line element set, you could calculate your entire orbit, uh, six orbital elements from this. And if you look at it, what do you, what do you have? You've got a satellite name and, and you've got uh, a number of designators. And, international designators. Uh, these are assigned by NORAD typically um, and placed in their database. Uh, you've got an epic year and Julian date fraction, so we'll cover that in the next slide. Uh, and then you've got a lot of information about uh, things which can be calculated related to your orbit. So mean motion, ballistic coefficients, uh, drag term is quite important when you're doing live operations. Uh, especially we had a, a, a fun incident where, where NORAD actually messed up satellite numbers and we had to help help them figure out whose satellite was what this was quite useful uh, this drag term in determining who's who owned which satellite on the screen um, and then uh, check sums to see if, if, if the data is accurate right and you could go through the rest and and, and see you know, very clearly how this fits into your overall mechanics uh, so we mentioned Julian date 
Uh, it's, it's actually, Julian date is, is you know, cal the number of days since day zero, which is uh, noon, January 1st, 4713 BC, right? So I, it's, it's a, just a useful tool for everybody to be from different countries or wherever you are to be on the same uh, date standard. So when you give a date, everybody knows uh, no matter where in the world you are and, and where and when it is. So this date that we had before in this TLE, 86, you know, 50 and, and this decimal point, very easy to read, uh, 86 stands for the year. And the rest of the fraction are the number of days in that year. So just by breaking this number apart, you could say 50 days and then a fraction. And then you could take that fraction, multiply by 24 hours in a day, usually the number of hours, and you just keep going by, by uh, minutes and seconds and you've got a breakdown for the, uh, for the, for the time and date which you'll see how it's useful later in Overcast. Okay, so uh, I went through that fairly quickly, and if, if you like, I could give you guys these slides. So if anybody has questions on, on some of the, the high-level issues. Um, and there's some simple tools if you just want to use them. These are free tools that you can just look at if you want to get uh, Overpass calculation and uh, get the Latin longitude of your ground station and you can figure it out. Um, but from the satellite operations perspective, uh, there are really three things that you're doing if you want to do space operations. Situational awareness, mission planning, and satellite communications. You do these three major tasks and you can control spacecraft. All right, so where are they? Situational awareness includes um, everything you need to know about the orbit, uh, conjunction analysis, which is finding out if, if uh, pieces in space are going to collide, which obviously is quite dangerous uh, for you and for the other uh, spacecraft colliding. Um, space weather information is important, and it all ties into FDIR, uh, which is an acronym standing for Fault Detection, Isolation, and Recovery. Okay, so basically saying, uh, is there a problem with the satellite? Is there a fault? And how do I recover from that fault? Because every minute that satellite is down, it could equate to millions of dollars worth of lost revenue for a customer, or it could result in loss of human life, you know, if it's a crew mission. So it's very important to do. All right, so that's, that's Houston, we have a problem in Apollo 13, if you guys have seen that movie. Um, but anyways, uh, mission planning. So you understand your own situation, and you can make commands, and that's mission planning, all right? That's everything related to launch. But after you've launched, mission planning is also related to uh, maneuvers, uh, related to uh, macros. A macro, by the way, is a set of commands that you work together and upload to the spacecraft. Uh, usually you have approvals and simulator, simulations that you do to, to approve it. And then a space operator executes the command um, and sends it to the SATCOM team where they're doing dish control, link budgets, uh, the actual focus on the actual connectivity between the satellite and the ground and doing the transmission, all right? Um, so so pretty, pretty clear if you're looking at mission control systems and control stations, you've got these big rooms. Uh, to be honest, I think they, they're, they're really inefficient, but they look really, really cool, you know, because you've got this big operation center where you've got a lot of people trying to do things. Um, you know, commercial mission control centers uh, focus on SATCOM services and imagery typically. Those are the type of customers that get. Uh, they focus on more automation and less people. And um, the uh, human crewed operations are just the opposite. They focus entirely on uh, human systems, people managing systems, rather, and they shy away very heavily from automation because it's, it's, they consider it to be much riskier if something goes wrong. Um, but anyways, if you look at the flow, here's how this works. Usually you have a science team, okay? Now this can be a, if it's a commercial mission, uh, then it's, it's usually not a science request, it's a data request. But um, the scientists will sit in a room and say, okay, here are the uh, Mars images that are important for, for us that we want to see. And they would pass it on to um, a past preparation group, uh, which is usually a group of uh, underpaid PhD students 
<laughs> Honestly, they're usually they're, they're usually uh, mostly doing simulations and planning, uh, maybe operations trainees, things like this, that would uh, sit in a room doing simulation and test, uh, constructing command macros and overpass estimation, and then handing it off to a team leader for approval, um, which is a more seasoned person that sends the final <coughs> macro pass execution team that uh, transmits commands and receives health and welfare from the satellite and payload data and uh, then conducts online real-time FDIR, okay? Um, and just to, to give you an example from a small satellite perspective, because it's one thing to look at a room like this and realize, hey, you know what? You know, we're not ESA, we're, we're, we're not ISRO. Uh, we're not NASA, we're just a, a, a university team maybe, or a high school team with their own satellite. Uh, if you're running a CubeSat, you, you'll probably have a screen that looks like this. So GPredict is really cool software, you can get it for free, um, which makes it even cooler as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but they have quite a bit of things that you've already seen, all these different tasks that you have to do on the dish side. Uh, we're looking at your overpass information, these are your ellipse uh, where the satellite can view you. Um, frequency management, and here, I, I don't know how well you can see this, but uh, this is the uh, frequency as it's being passed in from the satellite. You could actually hook up speakers and listen to, to the beeping. Uh, you got a strong signal here with this gap right here, which is the actual, if you were to listen to it, it actually sound like a beep, 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 and then you know you have your satellite's beacon. Uh, what's really cool is you can. So, see is this something we can get also? G Predict? Just yeah, to... yeah, anybody can download this. This is like, this is all free stuff, right? I mean, yeah. uh, before Sabre wrote our own software, this is what we started to get ourselves off off the ground, you know. So, uh, yeah, anybody can. And here's the here's the link. Actually, I put the link down here, so I'll give you these slides so you can play. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's 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 cool software. But you can you can see you set like a frequency. Uh, uh, spread that you're listening to. If you set this too wide, you've got these other interferences here that could accidentally add noise and then you might not be able to decode or you might have degradation like you saw in the, the other image. So you got to look out for that. But I mean, that's nothing special. It just takes a bit of practice. Uh, also notice this is kind of cool. You can see a slight movement to the right. You guys see that? Right. That is uh, the effect of Doppler shift of the satellite moving overhead. It's a very clear Doppler effects that you could get that you have to mitigate. Okay, so um, just in the interest of time, I'm going to skim through this a little bit. Uh, the process of talking to space, you know, usually prepare, review, test, encode, and encrypt. Uh, usually it's high, larger companies will encrypt. Uh, but not all of them, like the, the NOAA weather satellites, since they want everybody to use it, they give everybody the encoder and they're not encrypting. Um, but these two steps, either one is going to be important just to secure the data because you can have um, degradation of a command and accidentally the, the, the spacecraft is doing something it doesn't want to do. You don't want it to do. So I, I had one of my uh, professors tell me a story once. He was a, the project manager for Magellan that went to Venus. It's a great story. Uh, the Magellan spacecraft was launched from the space shuttle back in the 80s and it's on the launch pad and they're doing a countdown and you've heard these countdown before you know 29 28 27 etc the signal for the countdown was transmitted to a speaker where the general public was sitting and the frequency was so close to the actual spacecraft command frequency that the spacecraft started picking them up as, uh, on the valid command channel. Luckily, uh, the encoder caught it, but you can imagine if, if one of those was accidentally listed or identified mistakenly as a uh, fire thruster command, uh, it could have blown up the entire shuttle, including the entire crew. It would have been a catastrophe. But so, so that's why you always want to have some sort of encoding uh, and possibly encryption as part of your mission. All right. All right. Now, now we get to, the, to, to a little bit of fun, and I promise there's not too much math here. Just, the, just this one equation is really it. Um, 
but you, usually what you do is you plan your data limits based on your customer size. Uh, and what, the way you do it, if you're in conceptual design phase, is you use Shannon information, okay? Now, anybody who, who does SATCOM seriously looks at me funny when I put this equation up because it's a very um, general, very high uh, boundary uh, of uh, calculating the, the information capacity of your communication channel, right? And, and what it is is you get your bandwidth in hertz, that's as B, times the log base two of one plus your signal to noise ratio, okay? Gives you your maximum rate, which information can be transmitted over communication channel. The reality is it's gonna be much lower for a variety of different reasons. Like you might have the overheads, especially from your encoder. Um, it could have noise in the system, higher noise from space radiation and things like this. But this, this is good for just a real, real just, just touch. So just for fun, I usually have students, if I'm giving this at a class rather than or like a workshop rather than a presentation, say, try it out yourselves, go into an Excel spreadsheet uh, and put this up here and, and calculate the number of telemetry words per second your, your spacecraft can manage, right? And, and uh, a hint is a word is, it, we're talking about an eight bit word, okay? So I'll spare you that and just, just show you how, how I did it uh, here. Can you guys see the Excel spreadsheet? Is this all right? Well, I'll, I'll, yeah, I, I can see it, but uh, can you expand it? Because uh, I think it's coming up. Yeah, that should be good. Yeah. I'll make it even bigger for yeah. those of us. That's, yeah, that's right. so very easy. You know, you just whack open an Excel spreadsheet, 145 megahertz, signal to noise ratio. I just, you know, one times e to the minus four or whatever. Um, if, usually you don't know that in conceptual design, so you're putting this as a rough estimate. Uh, and then you multiply out, so you convert from megahertz to hertz, um, and then you know, log in, in, in you know, one plus B5, uh, the, this comma two is just your base two. That's how Excel likes to use it. Uh, and that gives you the bits per second of transmission rate for this frequency uh, as a rough upper boundary estimate. So you say, okay, five by eight gives you the number of bytes per second. Uh, and you put an expansion ratio, which is a bit arbitrary, but I, I put an expansion ratio of 0.5 to account for encoding and all these overheads that you might have. Uh, and that gives you a very rough estimate for planning purposes of 131 bytes per second. Okay, so that means if you have a three minute overpass, um, that equates to a certain number of seconds. Uh, and multiply the second by the number of, of, of bytes that you have in your rate, okay? And that gives you the, the total um, kilobytes for an overpass, okay? And then you could use that to calculate, you know, based on the size of your product, you could say, okay, how much income can we make per pass? Uh, and if we extrapolate over a year, here's how much money we're gonna make for our CubeSat for that year. One million dollars sounds exciting, um, but obviously next you got to calculate your passes, right? So uh, that's again um, that gives you the idea, and I think that you know we came up with this up here. Um, there are much, 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 much more complicated ways that you should be using if you're going to accurately calculate uh, a link budget. And so I put a link here if you if you all want to go what I call ninja level, which means uh, higher fidelity. Okay, so um, we'll skip the workshop and I'll just show you how Sabre does all, all of this. Uh, we have a product called the Predictive Ground Station Project. Affectionately, we call we call it Piggy. Uh, and, and, and Piggy has got a lot of features in there that, that combine uh, several of these software tools into one piece. So as you can see, so, software for space is very bespoke. It's kind of like it, you need to learn to need your own bread in order to make a sandwich if you're going to build a space mission. So we're trying to just tie everything together uh, in a graphic user interface that's kind of video game-like. So you actually control it like a first-person shooter uh, with uh, WASD and mouse. And you can see uh, you could expand out all the way. If, you, if you're astronomers especially, this could be interesting. We put the Hipparchus catalog, 150,000 stars in here. 
So you could go all the way out from the Milky Way back into um, back, back in, into your your solar system. Uh, we've got um, asteroids coming very soon, uh, but we've got a couple of things in here you guys might want to play with at some point. Uh, you could put down a, a ground station very easily. Now this ground station can be um, an actual ground station you connect to. So you can connect the client and it'll, it'll tell you the, the azimuth and elevation or right ascension declination, depending on what you want to do uh, to track uh, any stellar object, a star, a planet, a spacecraft, whatever you want to do. Uh, or you could hook up a telescope to it. And if you guys want to test that out someday, I'd you know, reach out to me and I'd love to have a play and we could try it. Um, but Maybe it, we do that. Yep. Okay. Um, but you know, you could put satellites in there and, and you get your overpass information like you could see here. Uh, and you can um, do a couple of fun things like, like uh, if you're doing space operations and you want to do diagnostics, you look inside the satellite into its guts and you could get telemetry if you're hooked up to a spacecraft. Uh, this is actually the design for the NASA ACE satellite. It's the Space Weather Observatory. And we, just, we just use it just for fun for, for the rest of our stuff. Uh, but you could track any sort of health in your spacecraft with it. Um, but what you really want to do for something like this is you want to maximize your orbits to get the most overpass you can. So what does it look like? About an hour overpass. So what can you do? Uh, you can sit here and you can modify your inclination. And we're at Sydney, so maybe 36 is a little bit better. You could increase your beam width if you got 120 degrees. And maybe you add another 10,000 meters to your semi-major axis. Okay, uh, so I'll lock that back in place. And now I get a much better view of the Earth. Okay. And in response, I have wider overviews. Now we're up to an hour and a half for each. So if I wanted to export it, I could just export this into, into a CSV. Um, and then you would get something uh, that looks like this, your overpass information. Okay. So what's important to you? And remember, we export it as a Julian date fraction. So this is what a Julian date fraction looks like. Okay. Um, these are the exact number of days that have passed since day zero. So what you need to do is you need to, and this is the acquisition of signal and the estimate date for the loss of signal. Right, so you know, if, if you wanted to propagate forward in time, uh, you, you 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 can you can do that quite easily. Whoop! I got to connect back to back to Earth so I don't lose Earth. Let me link back to Earth and propagate again. Right, so you could propagate some time forward in time and then pause it, and you could see on on this date on the 19th of October. So we we went two days into the future, and you could see where the satellite's going to be with reasonable accuracy. Right, so um, let's go back to our space mission here. Uh, so I've exported this into uh, acquisition and loss of signal, and by multiplying out, like I showed you in those slides, uh, I've got a duration in seconds, and I've got a duration in minutes, right? So you can come down and you can say, what is the average amount of minutes per day that we're gonna have satellite overpasses? Six minutes. That's not a whole lot. So maybe you could add more ground stations. Uh, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll put another one in, in India, another one in, in the UK or the US, uh, depending on, on what we think is, is best. And then you can, you can add those numbers up. And then when you come back into this sheet, then uh, overpasses H8. So where is that? Where is H8? Okay, so we're looking at the um, sum over a single day extrapolate it out over a year. So with this exact mission that we calculated out, we've gotten a whole year of annual income. So um, I've been using this for, for our operations center for a few years and and our, our team has has uh, done this for customers for like a hundred satellites for for Internet of Things, etc. And uh, that's that's what we do. So uh, I don't want to take any more of your time. It's 4.40 right now. Uh, I think we'll just leave it for questions and um, see what, what you want to do.
Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jason. That was. Right. No, that was uh, that was great. We really enjoyed the presentation. We found out so much more about space operations, and I'm sure we'll have a lot of offline questions for you too. But right now, let's see, uh, Madhu. I'll turn it over to you. Do you want to see if the students have any questions that you want to bring over to Jason? Uh, yeah, Mila, we have a lot of questions coming from students. Great, so uh, great. this. Yeah, <laughs> this question is from GD Goenka Sector 22 Rohini, one Shika, student of class 7. She wants to know that in cases of emergencies or space disasters, how do you tackle this situation? Well, it depends on the disaster. That's a great question. Uh, there are three different types of, of uh, faults, and we don't call them disasters. Uh, we, we call them faults, okay, because you could have a very simple fault that just degrades the data. And I think I showed this on one of the slides, like seeing degradation to your data is, is not a disaster, but it's definitely a fault. Or you could have something that, that's temporarily catastrophic, right? And, and you call that a, a, a single event upset. And what happens typically is the spacecraft will automatically shut down and turn back on again. So what could happen is if this is your spacecraft, radiation from the sun uh, usually electron, protons, maybe cosmic radiations will, will, will hit the spacecraft and it will turn a zero into a one. If it does that on the camera, you're okay because it just means that a pixel gets, gets degraded, pixel is back. If it happens in the command memory or if it happens in the, in, in the actual computer chip where it's running operations, uh, then it could send a memory address where it doesn't want to go and it's the equivalent of, of the blue screen of death on, on your Windows machine, which we've all experienced, you know, and it's a crash. So the this, this spacecraft will, will, will recognize the crash, shut everything down, turn everything back on again. Okay, so um, that's, that's typically how that's handled. Uh, the operator's job is then they're, they're watching the telemetry on the screen and they're waiting for one of those parts to turn red. Now, in, in conventional operation centers, it's very text-based interface. Uh, we're graphical, so instead of looking at a word to turn red, we're looking at a part to turn red. So for us, it's a little bit faster. But still, the process is, if it turns red, you look for, for where that defect is, and you try and fix that defect. Um, there's a third category. It's uh, human error. Um, and uh, that could cause the same effect. So the, the mission to Pluto uh, was in their test phase. The spacecraft turned on, and they're testing all, the, all of the data coming in. Um, and they were taking pictures as test pictures. But they had an error where they ran out of memory. And the very next picture they took, instead of starting from the beginning, went into that command memory where it's not allowed to go and uh, crashed the entire thing. So. Um, you, you have errors like this that are that are human error, even with very very experienced teams. You have to look out for. Them. Yeah. All right. Hope that answers. It. Yeah, absolutely. So the next question again from the same school, GD Goenka Sector Twenty Two, Rohini. Vanshika wants to know that how is the Julian date useful for missions? Well, um, it, it's it's a lot easier using Julian date a lot of people will, will will use julian date for planning uh for the reasons that i that i showed you uh because it's very easy to cut a day into excel spreadsheets and, and subtract them in fact that aol minus L, aos minus los i showed you is just a subtraction and it you usually can't can't do that if you're using a 24 hour it, it's you can but it's it's harder you need a bit of coding to do so um a lot of the, the systems that you're working with, with NASA, with professional orbital mechanics that, that, that you subtract or add or multiply, it's just a lot easier to use a, a day fraction than it is. Uh, and typically what, what you do, and certainly what we do on our end, is we'll convert the Julian date into a conventional 24-hour date. So if you look at, at the, at the I'll, I'll screen share again to show you, um, entire screen share. Uh, so if, if you look at our, I don't know, if, is that up yet? Yeah, it is. Okay, so if you look here, like our operations center, we're in Sydney, uh, and, and 
this date time is straight off of our CPU from our clock. So this isn't the Julian date. So we, we would have to convert in the back end the Julian date for the spacecraft to GMT or to whatever time zone you're in. Um, but the good news with when you're putting a, a Julian date time, uh, it's really um, useful for that because you've got people in operation centers around the world and people are on different time zones. And you, so when the spacecraft takes a picture at, I don't know, two, two o'clock uh, in, in, uh, in Bangalore time, what does that mean? Do you have to convert? It's, it just saves a lot of pain. Yeah, so the next there? question, yeah, next question from Mehek Verma, Indraprastha World School, Pashim Vihar. She wants to know that which out of the three examples given as uh, communications, imagery, and scientific data, which one is easy to understand? Hmm, that's a tougher one to answer. Uh, easy for whom, uh, I guess, is the, is the question I'd ask back. Uh, it, I don't see them as easier or harder. Uh, it, it's just depends on your use case and what what you need uh, for your mission. You know, so if if you have um, if you have a commercial mission, you're still collecting images, you're still collecting communications. Uh, but most commercial operation centers aren't doing anything with the data; they're just passing it on to customers, and the customers' roles to do stuff with the data. So I've seen companies that spawn that spawn out of this that don't do any spacecraft at all. They just, just do like machine learning on data to do stuff with it. On the other hand, you've got organizations like ISRO with the space uh, spacecraft orbiting Mars that's doing really, really rich science. And they have very specific needs uh, where they're looking at, it, at an image and they need high fidelity data, data for the image. So. Again, it's not it's not necessarily the complexity of the data as much as is the complexity of the mission. Thanks, Madhu. Are there any more? Yes, Mila. We have a lot of questions coming in from our students. So this one is from Samar GD Gonka Sector Twenty Two Rohini. Uh, wants okay. to know what measures are taken by the Sabre Astronautics to compensate for the damages done to the environment during satellite launches. Oh, I love this question. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, during satellite launches, you want to know. Um, we have a product that we don't advertise much, um, but we have actually sold one to, to uh, Manipal Institute of Technology out in out, out, out India. And I love their spacecraft team, actually, the Parikshit satellite. If you're ever in the neighborhood, you've got to give them a, a, a space hug from me because they're a good group. Um, but we made a tether deployer that allows the spacecraft to deorbit uh, at the end of its mission life. So it, it unrolls a conductive tether, uh, and the, the tether is a special material uh, made out of aricon, which is uh, as conductive as copper, but you can weave it like a textile. Really fascinating stuff. So if you think about a conductive line traveling through the magnetic field of the Earth, a large, weak magnetic field, then you have the right hand rule means you can have a current going this way and then uh, a force called the Lorentz force going this way. So it unrolls the tether and then the spacecraft gets a current this way and then it drags the spacecraft down, down to Earth at the end of its mission line. And we have our first launch with India next year. So it's really exciting. Um, any space mission, like Sabre is not responsible for uh, a spacecraft during launch. Okay, that's usually the rocket is responsible for that, and the space owner is responsible for that. Uh, we're more responsible for keeping the satellite alive while it's already in orbit. Okay, and when that happens uh, with with faults, um, we usually take we usually work with uh, NORAD to make sure that we know where the satellite is, so we know where to communicate. Uh, and we also have a lot of machine learning tools that we use to do diagnostics. So the most important part is saying, all right, here's an, an error on the satellite, but where is that error coming from? Is it radiation? Is it internal? Is it human error? You know, it's usually going to be one of those those three. So uh, that, that's how we handle it. It's just, we just work really hard on the diagnostics to find out where the problem is in the first place. 
थैंक यू साक्षी ऑफ क्लास एट फ्रॉम इंद्रप्रस्था वर्ल्ड स्कूल पश्चिम बिहार वॉन्ट्स टू नो हाउ आर सैटेलाइट मिशन कंट्रोल्ड How are satellite missions controlled? Controlled, yeah. Um, it kind, kind of, kind of, kind of like I described in the middle of the presentation, where I was talking about um, the command macros. So what happens is uh, you're trying to think of it like controlling a robot. The difference being is the robot is several thousand kilometers away, flying at eight kilometers a second. You can't just walk up and and fix something if it's broken. Uh, and you have to plan ahead for when the satellite is going to be overhead at exactly the time you want it to be overhead. So what you do is you use software like Piggy to do your overpass, and you put the ground station where the customer is going to, be, and you find that time as the timestamp, and then you set up a list of commands. Okay, so it could be rotate 30 degrees, open your camera door, take photo. Close camera door, rotate back, and then you set those commands together as a macro, and then you upload it to the satellite with the right timestamp. So when the satellite gets to the right time, the macro activates, and then it does its sequence, takes a picture. Then the next time it's over the ground, here's our ground, here's the satellite, right? Next time it's over the ground, it'll transmit down the results to the ground station, and you get your data. And then you could pass it on to your customer. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, another, just, uh, yeah, we have another student, Panka Sector Twenty Two, Rohini Malle, wants to know which is by far the biggest satellite sent by your company. Oh, uh, we we don't send satellites; we only control them. Um, We, we like our, our people have worked on Hubble and the ISS before, as I said. Uh, uh, we've done diagnostics for NASA ACE, which is a medium-sized spacecraft. It's about the size of a small automobile. Um, and right now, we're getting customers that are uh, microsat, like 50 kilograms, 150 kilograms, like this. And uh, we just got a new customer that, that that's doing very small satellites, maybe. Uh, 20, 24 kilograms, but they want to launch a hundred of them, and that is actually more interesting than launching one big satellite. Launching a hundred small ones from an operation standpoint is just like it's. I'm like a kid in a candy store, man. I'm going to have so much fun. So um, that's that's kind of what it's like. We have done uh, a. a, a uh, Simulated space mission for a Mars base uh, with IIT Mumbai came to Australia with the Mars Society of Australia, and we did the uh, mission operations for them. And that was a big one because there were a lot of moving pieces, people with spacesuits and robots and habitat. Uh, but it, it was it was a lot of fun because we we had to put in a 20 minute time delay for every transmission. So uh, even the data had to be set up 20 minute time delay. So really learning what an operations center would have to do if they're controlling a team on Mars, you can't really do it from an operations center. You know, they're more like a support center at best. Uh, so while we get Madhu back on, uh, could you tell us a bit about what you did with Hubble and ISS? Because you know we've heard so much about those. Yeah, that would be exciting uh, to the students. Okay, uh, for for the ISS, uh, this was my first space job. Actually, was working on the ISS, and uh, I, I did um, testing. I was a, I was a test engineer for the intermediate command module, which um, yeah, the, the the U.S. Navy was putting together because they didn't know if the Russians were going to continue flying uh, with them or not. It was a very yeah, it was all right. Um, Hubble was a bit more exciting because I was doing the uh, flight software for an instrument called uh, Wide Field Camera Three. Right, so Wide Field. If you don't know, I mean, if, if you know what Hubble looks like, it's a, it's a big telescope in space. Uh, the telescope end is here, the tube. You got it like any other telescope. Right, you work with telescopes. You get a big tube and a big mirror, and between the mirror and, a, and then you got all these collectors, and it's got it's got these slots in here. 
uh, and they slot the instruments in like plug and play. Okay, uh, plug and play, but it's a radiation hardened 486 computer, really, really old, right? Uh, like 1986 computer. Um, so uh, one of the instruments was called wide field camera, uh, and this was the third iteration, um, and it had ultraviolet and infrared spectrometers. Uh, and I, I did the, the software for the ultraviolet camera and the command and data handling, so handling all the data bits going from the satellite to ground. And that that was that launch back in 2010. It was very exciting. I cried like like I was a 10 year old boy. I cried. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> So, Madhu, we just have time for a last question. Um, yeah, Mila, we have a question from Indipristha World School, Pashim Bihar. Vanshika wants to know, what different things can you offer apart from the satellites that are already in space? Um, okay, I, 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 uh, you mean as a company or, or what do you mean? Well, okay, can I'll, you elaborate yeah, the question? Just a second, surely. Yeah, uh, the student wants to know the different things that that you can offer apart from the satellites that, that are already in space. So maybe she wants to know more about what, the things you do for satellites. Okay. Um, well, look, I mean, I, a lot of our research is in controlling satellites, uh, but a lot of it is machine learning based. So, you know, we, we've we've done uh, research studies on on uh, on um, not. I mean, if you could diagnose and observe the complex behavior of a satellite, then you could do some very interesting things. We're we're making some avionics that can kind of like a transformer auto change itself. To, to if it's hot, it turns into you know, it, it puts cold protection on it. If there's radiation, it protects itself in a special way. Um, so that, that's quite exciting for, for, for us to get up there. And we have a launch uh, that's been approved for with, uh, with NASA on the, on the ISS uh, in, in a few years. Um, we also make a beer that you can drink in space uh, with, with a brewing company out of, out of Australia. It's a very Australian project. You know? I don't tell it very often because I forget about everything else that, that we do. Uh, but we've got a... Uh, human physiology research, where um, you know, we, we looked at, at how to how to the alcohol absorption rate in, in the human body. Um, alcohol is interesting because uh, two of the, the biggest uh, challenges for uh, space flight, for human space flight, is radiation damage and osteoporosis or bone loss. And small quantities of of let me be 150 mils, millimeter milliliters per day, which is maybe I don't know about this much. Um, this is tea, by the way, not beer. Uh, you know, but 150 milliliters per day actually has some protective benefits. Uh, so, so I've I've been able to go on parabolic flights and on the, the zero G corporations, uh, uh, zero G aircraft. Um, so I've done some of that. That's kind of like our fun research. So uh, the rest of our research is is how to control complex systems. Uh, controlling 100 satellites at once, you know, it's, it's pretty much what we're about. Yeah, I'm sure you have a lot of volunteers who won't want to go for the alcohol testing and, now you and zero G. Everything else I've said for the last hour, yeah, I've talked about it. But it's, it's okay. Um, have fun with it. No, it, your whole talk was very exciting and, you know, I, um, on behalf of space, I would like to, you know, uh, we are going to share this video to, with many more students, and uh, uh, I hope to get back in touch with you offline and see if we can do something fun with the students, like play with one of your softwares, or maybe you can point us to one of the freely available softwares. And uh, sure. I would, uh, I would like to close on that and thank you so much for joining us. Would you like to make a, a last? Uh, comment. Madhu, Madhu, I'll let you thank him first and uh, if you have any more comments. Thank you. Thank you. Students are really happy and they are, they are sending thank you messages for answering their questions. Oh, man, love it. Love it. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure and an honor to talk to you. 
Uh, I'm always excited and, and happy to work with students. I, I mean, you're the future of the industry. Um, it's an important time to get into it now. As I, as I said, you could do stuff on your own that benefits India, that benefits the world, that benefits clean technologies and, and smart cities and all of these, these things which need space data in order to work. And it's all happening now. So you're, you're entering this, this industry at an extremely exciting time. And I, I, all I really want to do is help everybody else to, to grow and, and do your own work the way you want to do it. So uh, thanks again for the opportunity to talk to you guys. And I wish you the very best of luck in whatever futures you choose to make. Thank you so much. Thank and, you. Uh, thanks again on behalf of all of us. And uh, I'll, I'll point out the YouTube link to you so you can also use it. And we will share, surely send you the thank you notes from the students. Uh, so great. Thanks, Madhu. And thanks, Jason, for joining us from all the way across the world. And thank awesome. you, viewers. Uh, yeah, thanks to all our viewers for joining us on this occasion. And we loved having your questions. So uh, we, uh, we'll end this hangout now. Thank you. And have a great day, everybody. All right, great. All the best.